Hello, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks to Medicinal Genomics for putting this on, and uh, really thanks for just taking the time to stick around. Uh, great conference, great speakers. What I'm here to talk to you about today is growing from seed. Um, we have a small production company uh, based out of Oregon. Uh, we've been in business for about four years. My brother and I co-founded it in 2015. And this past season was sort of a culmination of a lot of the research and development that we've been working on over, the, over that four years uh, that resulted in <clears throat> uh, about 4,000 acres of production across the United States for phytocannabinoid-rich CBD, uh, CBD hemp, um, roughly 15 million pounds of biomass, testing at around 10% uh, on whole plant extraction. Um, so what I'm here to talk to you about is a little bit of the behind the scenes of what we do and how we do it. First off, I do want to just say thanks to Medicinal Genomics, uh, Orange Photonics, and Pixis Laboratories in Portland. All three of these companies have radically changed the way that we actually go about the plant breeding process. They have markedly accelerated what we can do and how quickly we can bring uh, true F1 hybrids to, uh, to the market for farmers to produce with. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I did not thank everybody on my staff at Oregon CBD. <clears throat> Every day is Monday, uh, Monday one, Monday two, Monday three. Uh, we've been working tirelessly for the last four years to be able to make sure that phytocannabinoids, non-psychoactive cannabinoids, could be accessed by everybody in the country, everybody in the world, at a reasonable price. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that's come about. Uh, one way to think about cannabis legalization in the United States, we essentially have three separate markets. Uh, my background is actually I have a PhD in sociology. Uh, my research was on the political economy of cannabis and the way that it was unfolding uh, in 2013 and 2014. The way to think about this is that we essentially have three channels. The first is the adult use, medical use, uh, recreational, however you want to describe it. And it's THC dominant. Um, there's a high regulatory burden, uh, seed to sale tracking, uh, testing, which is all, also a good thing. Uh, but the downside of that is that you're looking at a fairly small user base. Anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of the population at any given time uh, is consuming THC. There are other cannabinoids that are obviously being used, but that's, that's the predominant cannabinoid. What's interesting about that, too, and this is an out, uh, something that came out of my research, is that the total U.S. demand for THC could be met uh, on about 6,000 acres if produced right in southern Oregon. So this is a, a small market relative to the non-psychoactives, um, and it's easily capturable by, by folks with a lot of capital. Um, the other aspect of this is the pharmaceutical industry, and we've obviously heard a lot about different compounds uh, that have been developed and trialed and that are coming online. It's fantastic. We love it. Uh, but again, the user base in this situation is determined in part by the FDA and insurance companies, as well as the applicability of each one of these very specialized compounds for specific treatments. We like industrial hemp, uh, at least from our perspective, one, because it's not psychoactive. Two, there was a very low regulatory burden getting into this industry. And the user base is pretty big. Um, you're talking about all vertebrates, and according to some of the research, there are some invertebrates as well. We're not sure how we're going to capitalize on that financially, but <laughs> it's out there. Uh, real quick, hemp and marijuana in the United States, there's a differentiation between them with hemp uh, being anything below 0.3% THC. This is an, obviously an arbitrary socially constructed limit that dates back to uh, Small and Cronquist, a publication from some can, uh, Canadian scientists in 1976 that were examining new leaf tissues on mature plants. Um, obviously, that's uh, not necessarily the best way to go about it. Today, we have better tools to assess what the differences are. And truly, when you look at the literature, it says uh, most of the genomic data and literature on cannabis at this point says it's all the same. There's just two very closely linked genes, eight centimorgans apart on the same chromosome that differentiate between these different types. If you step back and you look at this from a perspective from a producer, you're interested in trying to have large plant numbers to be able to do uh, targeted breeding programs and develop new unique cultivars. Anything that's not type 1 or type 2 is essentially fair game if you jump into the hemp industry. And with the passage of the 2014 Farm Bill, we all had the opportunity to do that. Um, so the originating question that really drove our research was how can we make non-psychoactive cannabinoids both available and affordable? A uh, picture of my, uh, my trail running buddy. In 2014, he was about 11 years old, hips were hurting, he was uh, suffering from occasional seizures, and I found that CBD really was an effective treatment for him, helped out a lot. The problem was is it was about $2,500 a pound wholesale when THC was about $2,200 a pound wholesale at the same time. Just seemed ridiculous. So we started 
to try to figure out how to, to alleviate that. The goal was to essentially replicate what's already been done. This is no secret. Most of us are all doing the same thing that somebody's done before. I hate to burst everyone's bubble, but we did the same thing. Uh, we tried to replicate Hortifarm and GW Pharma's single cannabinoid chemotype breeding program. But importantly, we were not focused on just developing individual clones for production in sealed warehouses or greenhouses or et cetera. We really wanted to be able to produce true F1, 100% female plant varieties that could be deployed across the country with small farmers uh, being able to produce these compounds. Um, we also needed to address some of the, the big issues that come along with large scale production, namely harvesting uh, and drying, either using mechanization uh, or Using, using nature when, when at all possible. And that required that we'd have to develop independent lines based on photoperiod sensitivity. And that included day neutral plants, which are considered auto flowering, uh, early flowering plants, which is something that we actually invented, uh, quote unquote, invented again, following in other people's footsteps. But these are plants that start flowering uh, shortly after uh, uh, the peak in June of sunshine and uh, essentially finish up in, in the month of September in most locations across the United States, as well as what most people are accustomed to, which is, a, we call it a traditional long season plant. This is the behind the scenes. This is uh, sort of the, the in-depth breeding program uh, that, that we operate uh, at our facilities. And what this requires in terms of being able to develop individual true breeding F1 lines is you start off with two completely uh, unrelated, very distinct parental lines. You cross those two plants, uh, depending on what your goals are, whether it's a chemotype, uh, a chemotype switch, or increasing cannabinoid content, or creating structural differences in the plant itself. Uh, you inbreed those, uh, excuse me, you cross those and create your F1 hybrids. From there, we isolate each one of those F1s that come out, and generally this is uh, you don't need a very large sample size when you're working with F1s. Uh, sometimes we go down to 20 plants. Inbreed each one of those, collect the seeds off of them using a self-fertilization technique described by Ram and Set in 1980, uh, 1982 using silver thiosulfate. The resulting seeds that come off of those plants are again isolated. We grow those out, we spend our summers growing out F2s, um, which is sort of where unicorns emerge. This is a common thing that folks are looking for in the plant breeding world where they are just absolute uh, masterpieces of recombination, taking the best of both parts of the parents, both of the P1 and the P2, and creating something unique, diverse, and new. From there, to be able to, to isolate and lock in those traits, we continue to inbreed, generation after generation after generation, in isolation, uh, as long as we can. One of the biggest challenges that we run into, uh, especially on the hemp side, is that infertility tends to set in fairly quickly. In general, uh, we average about F4, uh, the F4 generation. It's a third round of selfing. Uh, basically attempting to reduce uh, heterozygosity, make the plants as true breeding as possible, so that when we do end up eventually outcrossing it to create our F1 hybrids, that you end up with uh, high levels of uniformity. So again, just to highlight, on the left you're seeing the development of one line, and that, li that arrow pointing to the circle is another independent line that has to be developed just to make each one of these F1 hybrids. Once we've isolated these plants, uh, before we release it to farmers, we run progeny trials. So we'll have a number of different varieties that came out of these different inbreeding projects. We cross it out to our pollen donor, and then we run our trials to figure out which of these plants are most stable when outcrossed. And in general, we usually come down to one or two plants, and those plants are lucky enough to get uh, put into our breeding programs, mass propagated, and uh, end up resulting in producing uh, seed for farmers. So the take home message on this is, um, one, if you're a plant breeder and you're really looking for something unique, F2 is where it happens. There's just incredible things that pop up here. Um, and it's a very different approach from what we end up seeing uh, in traditional cannabis where you're crossing two usually polyhybrid varieties that end up not uh, being true breeding when you try to put them in the field. But large scale field production requires a very different approach and it's only solved with true F1s. Uh, what we've been able to do with uh, the help of these analytical testing companies and this breeding process is essentially be able to create new varieties in anywhere between 18 to 24 months depending on chemotype uh, or the ter specific terpene combinations that we're looking for. We end up with very vigorous, very uniform, structurally stable, uh, dense, high yielding, just beautiful flowers uh, that are 
perfect for farmers who just need to put plants in the ground and figure out how to harvest them to get them to market. And the really cool part about this is that we've actually been able to achieve 99.97% uh, uh, female plants in these, in these fields. It's essentially one in 4,000 plants ends up having a male phenotype. We've actually tested it. They all have two X chromosomes, they're really female, um, but they have a male phenotype. And if you let them pollinate plants, 50% uh, of the following progeny will end up having that male phenotype. So they're problematic, need to be removed. Uh, we're working on trying to get it to 100%, but at this point, 99.97 is, we think it's pretty good. Um, as I just mentioned, our CBD lines, uh, this is basically a, a three to four year project. We had our first lines in 2014. Uh, we outcrossed those using uh, the, the schema that I showed before, and we've conducted field trials uh, in 2016 to 2017 before releasing those to farmers. And again, we had over 4,000 acres in production in industrial hemp legal states across the country. Um, yields ranged anywhere between 2,000 to 8,000 pounds per acre, and you're looking at a content of 8 to 12 percent on biomass, although the outliers in, for all of the varieties that we developed are well over 20 percent on total CBDA content uh, on trimmed flower tops, which is basically we've taken industrial hemp and turned it into the phytocannabinoid rich THC cultivars with great terpenes and great structure that everybody loves, but you can produce them in a field. Uh, some shots of that. Uh, the shot on the left is a 1,500-acre farm in Kentucky. Um, same shot on the right, just a close-up. If you're interested in seeing more pictures of this, we have uh, we had a photo contest on Instagram, hashtag best Oregon CBD photos. Uh, absolutely beautiful results. Uh, great, great plants, and uh, really the farmers made us look good. So that's one compound. Obviously, the goal is to be able to isolate and uh, put into production other compounds as well. Our next target was CBG. We found our first uh, pure CBG line in the first quarter of 2017. Uh, this plant was about 9.5% CBG, uh, less than 0.1% THC, non-detectable CBD, uh, and it had a 100 to 1 ratio for CBG to THC, which when you're looking at the industrial hemp uh, laws in the farm bill in the United States, 0.3% means that you could actually run up to 30% CBG on a trim flower and still be legal uh, for interstate uh, commerce in the United States. Um, we have improved these lines uh, over the last year and a half, and we conducted large-scale field trials uh, this past season. Um, this is a picture of this. Again, this is no sleight of hand. I, some people, for some reason, think that when you have a, a a high level of CBG, it's because the plant was harvested early or you did some sort of magic with, uh, with the root zone. These are just full-term plants that happen to have uh, THC turned completely off uh, just through a random mutation that we happen to find, the needle in the haystack, and uh, a, a regular non-functional uh, CBD allele. So this particular plant tested at 18.9% CBG, that's on a trim flower. Um, and again, you can see the, the THCA content on that is uh, way below the 0.3% requirement to be federally legal. Um, the beauty of this, too, is once you start inbreeding plants, another tip, if you can, F2 is where the magic happens, but inbreeding is where you can really lock in and find incredible results. With the inbreeding on our CBG lines, we're uh, able to attain, right now, the, the highest level that we've seen is 480 to 1 uh, ratios of CBG to THC which means that you can make oil, uh, in this case, 40% CBG rosin, and still be below the federal, uh, the federal limit of 0.3% on THC. It's, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, we've also discovered CBC-rich plants. Uh, CBC-rich plants are a little bit more difficult in that there is a linkage between uh, cannabinoid content, total cannabinoid content production, and the CBC gene for some reason, and we haven't been able to get over about 5% uh, 5% total cannabinoid content on those lines, but the, they are CBC rich, uh, anywhere between 20 to 30% of the total uh, cannabinoid fraction. Um, there may be better ways of going about producing CBC, uh, which would be maybe isolating it in CBD lines or in CBG lines, uh, but we're working to improve that and we'll have uh, field trials out in 2019. Uh, again, just some analytical data to back that up. I'm not kidding, they're real. Uh, my favorite thing that we discovered this past summer, um, in part because I do like beer and I like the hops industry, but I feel bad for hops growers. It just doesn't look like much fun. Um, we, 
Thanks for the laugh. Uh, we discovered cannabinoid-free plants. Uh, and there is literature that describes the functional mechanisms that make this happen. It's upstream of CBG production. Uh, you're basically just turning off some of the precursor chemicals, and the plant only bioaccumulates terpenes. It is really cool. You're looking at the plant. It looks resinous. It looks greasy. It smells wonderful. There's no cannabinoids. Uh, so we found this, and uh, when you look at the literature, it suggests that it takes two generations of, uh, so you can outcross to any, any flavor that you're interested in, uh, sour diesel, et cetera, et cetera. And within two generations, you can identify plants that have that same terpene profile, but no cannabinoids whatsoever. Three minutes. Um, I'm really excited about it because it's more agronomically efficient than hops. It doesn't suffer from many of the same diseases, in part because we are growing from seed. Uh, and they do contain more oil on average in the same terpene combinations as some of the, the traditional hops. So we're, we're very excited to be able to work with uh, the brewing industry and being able to bring these to fruition and put them in beers uh, here shortly. And again, just to back that up, no cannabinoids and the raw chromatogram for that. Uh, anything on the, the left-hand side of that uh, one minute mark, uh, I was told by Pixis Labs that there was just something caught in their, in their HPLC machine. Uh, Close-up picture of these cannabinoid-free plants. Again, the trichomes, uh, they're, they're covered, obviously covered. They look very resinous, but the trichome heads are much, much smaller in size uh, than, than we see with, with other plant lines. Last little bit here, we have discovered multiple THCV, CBDV, and CBGV lines. Uh, now, these are lines that do not have any of the propyls as the dominant fraction, but through inbreeding, we are working to improve those. Uh, and have heightened expression ready uh, throughout the rest of this year and into 2019. Field, productions are, uh, field production is slated for uh, field trials for 2020, and we hope to have these out to farmers everywhere across the country uh, in 2021. The idea behind this is we know what's going to happen with the cannabis industry. THC is an easy to monopolize market. You're gonna end up with, just like the alcohol industry, several, several very large companies dominating production. But if we can continue to make each one of these novel, non-psychoactive cannabinoids available for farmers to be able to produce, we have a chance to at least keep some of the culture and some of the approaches that we had uh, in the cannabis industry leading up to legalization alive and well. One minute. Uh, again, looking ahead uh, for 2019, we thought that CBD was probably gonna wash out. It's not, we've already got contracts in place for over 15,000 acres. It's almost a fourfold increase over what uh, was produced this year using our seed. Uh, so we're looking to increase our capacity up to about 50,000 acres uh, by the end of uh, 2019. And like I mentioned at the very beginning, $2,500 pounds to get non-psychoactive cannabis to make my dog's hips feel better just seems wrong. Luckily, we're down to anywhere between $25 to $50 a pound for equivalent biomass at this point, and that's over the course of four years. So we're very happy. While it's not necessarily great for farmers, it's great for consumers and people that benefit from non-psychoactive cannabinoids, and we anticipate that this is going to continue forward uh, as time goes on and we get better plants. Thank you.